good morning and welcome to the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, and welcome to Main Street Presbyterian Church in particular. We are happy to see all of you this morning uh, for the fellowship and the worship that we have together as God's people is uh, the highlight of our week. I uh, trust it is for you, uh, as it certainly is for me. Uh, we want to remind you to take note of the announcements in the bulletin. Uh, just one to mention really is the Children's Ministry Committee that will meet on Tuesday, uh, <clears throat> not the 6th, but the 8th at 6 o'clock in the library. Uh, so if you're on that committee, please be aware of that. We're going to be worshiping this morning uh, beginning with Psalm 113. And as we do that, let's be mindful all the way through our worship today that we are uh, moving up towards uh, what really will be the uh, focus, the ultimate focus towards the end of the service. And that, of course, will be after the preaching of the word will be the administration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So as we go through our time of worship today, keep that in mind of what we're going to be doing in every part of the worship service, of course. But as we do every first Sunday, we will uh, participate in the Lord's Supper. Our call to worship is from Psalm 113, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Take your hymnals and let us praise God in song as we use hymn 100. We'll stand as we sing hymn 100. Let us pray. 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand you raise, make great praise and give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and we praise your glorious name. You are the triune God. We have sung of your holiness. We've sung of the fact that we know that the angels continuously, reverently bow in your presence, offering to you their praises, because that is what you deserve to receive from all that you've made. You made us and remade us in Christ so that we now can praise you sincerely, thankfully, joyfully. And we ask, O oh Lord, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would be able to do so this morning. Work in our hearts as we hear your word and sing your word and pray your word and see your word in the sacrament. O oh Lord, may all of this point us to Jesus. And may we see that without him, we can do nothing. But we can do all things through him who strengthens us because of his atoning work for us. Hear our prayer, for we ask all of this in the name of Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. As we confess a summary of the Christian faith based on the great truths of Scripture that are emphasized so clearly, let us join together with the saints all over the world as we worship today and as we confess together the answer to this question. Christian, what is it that you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God's Word instructs us on the matter of the stewardship of our entire lives, being good stewards and managers, if you will, of what God has entrusted to us. And one of those ways that we do that is by supporting the work of the church in building the kingdom and growing the kingdom throughout the world. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10 are our scripture for this morning. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, that your barns may be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine.
Good morning. My name is Alan Brewer, and I'm one of the ruling elders here at Main Street. A uh, little bit of a correction in your bulletin on our reading of the Psalms today. We are going to be reading Psalm 3, but we're not going to do it responsively. Uh, but if you'd like to follow along, I'll be reading it. And uh, if you'd like to follow along, it's found in your pew Bible on page 448. Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. If you would bow your heads now and let's go before the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we come before you this morning as creatures before their awesome creator, sheep to their good shepherd, children at the knees of our heavenly father. What a blessing, what a privilege it is to come to you in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. We are the body of Christ and individually members of it. In one spirit, we were baptized into one body. What an encouragement it is to remember your faithfulness and watch care over us. You have been our strength when we were weak, our courage when we were afraid, and our joy when we were discouraged. Grow us in our faith. Increase in us our knowledge and understanding of who you are as our God and who we are to be as your people. As a church family, we ask that our love for you and for one another would grow. Help us to care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We pray that the love you have for us would be reflected in our lives to all those that live and work with us. As we look at the world around us, there's so much darkness. So many tell us that satisfaction and contentment are in the things of this world. The temptations seem to come on every front. Keep us strong in our faith in you. May we be diligent in spending regular time in your word and prayer. Help us to keep our focus on you, knowing that you and you alone are the only source of true happiness and security in our lives. We pray for the unbelieving and lost. May your spirit be at work in their hard hearts to soften them and create a desire, an appetite for you. Use us as missionaries to carry your word to them and minister to their needs. We pray for those in our body who are hurting and in need today. Some are physically sick and fighting serious disease. Several are recovering from surgery and undergoing therapy. We ask that you work in their bodies to soothe the pain and bring the needed healing. May we be sensitive to their needs and quick to provide that much needed act of love or encouraging word. Be near to those that are dealing with difficult relationships. So often there does not seem to be any answer for the problems, but you are a sovereign, all loving God who does not desert your children. Guard them and deliver them. May they take refuge in you, and may integrity and uprightness preserve them as they wait for you. We pray for a special blessing of your wisdom, discernment, patience, encouragement, and strength for our church officers. We thank you for your calling these men to be leaders and shepherds of the flock, 
and their willingness to stand up and answer your call. Guide and direct them as they make decisions concerning the care and direction for this church. May we be diligent in praying for them and supporting the work of our church. We thank you for Aaron and your bringing him to serve you and minister to us at Main Street. Continue to give him wisdom and knowledge as he prepares to preach your word. Guard and protect he and his family from the wiles of the evil one. Continue to grow him as he walks out your call on his life and give him strength as he leads and takes care of many of the day-to-day -day needs of our body. How good it is to serve the awesome sovereign God and to know that you not only hear our prayers, but you are already at work in every situation, using it for our good and our lives as your people. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and faithful hearts to trust and look for your hand at work. Hear us now as we join together in lifting up to you the prayer you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Take your insert now, and we're going to stand together as we sing, There is a Higher Throne. And when we get to the end, the very end, we'll repeat the chorus. Let's stand together.
Amen. Please be seated. If you have your copy of God's Word with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel according to John. We will be spending our time in John chapter 1, looking at verses 19 to 28. This section of John's Gospel marks a shift. For the past several weeks, we have been in the prologue, the first 18 verses. These verses give us an overview, an outline. John wants to state clearly and plainly, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He does that at the outset of his gospel. And now, from here forward, we will shift from this um, thinking about God to hearing the firsthand accounts and events and from those witnesses, and one in particular today, that we've been talking about. We shift from talking about God, and this morning talking about John the Baptist, to hearing from John the Baptist as he proclaims who God is. And John's an interesting person. He garnered much attention. One of the commentaries I read this morning said that the early church was so intrigued by him that in some instances they wrote more about John the Baptist than they did Jesus Christ. For his ministry was unique, he caused a lot of questions to be asked and, and quite a stir in Jerusalem. And that's what we're going to focus on today. We're going to really ask a simple question and it's a question I'm sure all of us have asked at some point in our lives or another. Who are you? Who are you? How do you define yourself? Why are you the way that you are? It really encompasses a person, doesn't it? And that's what's going to be asked of John the Baptist this morning. And so I invite you to listen along as we read the Word of God and we ask that same question. Who are you? I will begin in verse 19 and read through the 28th verse. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of the one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, Then why are you baptizing, if you're neither the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me as we go to God in prayer and ask his blessing upon this time. Dear Heavenly Father, the quest for identifying ourselves, for realizing who we are. We know that culture is wrapped up in this question, but we're not interested in what culture says about us. Lord, we're interested in who you say we are. And we know that is true in John's life as it is evidence before us this day. And I pray, O oh God, that what is true of John would be true of us, that to speak of ourselves is to speak of you. And so I ask, O oh Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you give us understanding this day with eyes to see and ears to hear, that we might hear your truth and be transformed. I pray all of these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. There are many ways that we can identify someone, isn't it? For some people, they use their profession as an identifying feature. Oh, that is so-and-so. They are a baker. Or they build houses. Or they work with horses. In simpler times, this would have been a, a great way to identify someone in your town or in your village. When you needed a blacksmith, there was one option. Go to the blacksmith. 
And so to say, I am the blacksmith, you knew who they were, you knew where they lived, you knew what they did, you knew various aspects about their lives due to their profession. For others, we may find that we identify ourselves with our hobbies or with our skills. That so-and-so, they like to keep bees. Or, you know, Shelly, Shelly loves flowers. You remember Dave, right? He is really into archery. Bill fixes cars in his spare time. Again, this could be effective in in smaller communities and areas where there's not really that many beekeepers. And so when you want to know about Shelly or when you want to know about Dave, you go, oh yeah, that's what they do. And and you have this idea, this this mindset of when someone keeps bees, there's a certain personality, there's a certain um, set of traits, characteristics that follow along with that. But in our society today and in our growing world where it's more often than not you know not only one but many of these people, we use our names. Our our names are are simple identifying features that, that define who we are. My name is Aaron Suber and I would dare say I am the only Aaron Suber in the room today. If you're an Aaron Suber, I'd love to meet you. We're probably related. But chances are that's not the case, right? So we use our names, our titles uh, given to us at birth to differentiate ourselves from one another. Such was the case as for John the Baptist. Now granted, John kind of encapsulates all three of these things together, identifying by profession, by name, and by hobby. He was unique, right? When we think of John the Baptist, we think of the way he dressed. We think of what he did. We think of who he was, what he represented. Even his name itself, John the Baptist, you could also translate that as John the Baptizer. And so in some ways he's identified by what he did. Because of this, when people spoke of this John, there were questions especially from the religious elite in Jerusalem. They wanted to know, well, John, why are you the baptizer? Why do you dress like a prophet? Why do you call Jews to repentance? Let's find out. And so that's what we have today. We really have an interrogation of John the Baptist to answer that question. Who are you that you do what is before you? And as we think about that, we're really going to see it in two um, ways this morning. We're going to see who John is, and because he's John, the only way to know who John is is to point to know who Jesus Christ is. And my prayer for all of us, as we think about these two points, these two questions, to know ourselves should be to know Christ. So much so that when we speak of us What makes Aaron, Aaron? It should come out of that. He is a follower, a disciple, a lover of Christ. So that's my challenge for us this morning as we walk through this interrogation of John the Baptist. Would people know Christ if asked, who are you? Certainly is the case for John. Twice now in in John the author's gospel, he's used John the Baptist as a key witness Uh, Up in verses 6 and 7, we're told John the Baptist would be sent by God to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. You see, his purpose, his point, his goal was to tell people about Jesus so that they might believe. Verse 15 says that John, again, he bore witness and he proclaims Jesus holds more authority because he existed before me. And as we look at our text this morning, we see how he did these things. We start to see less the description of the proclamation and more the proclamations itself. Now, who is he speaking it to? Here we have this phrase, the Jews. Get used to that phrase. We're going to hear it a lot over this letter. But what's important, when you hear that phrase, you have to ask which Jews? Again, this is kind of all about titles today. John, the author, will use this title in a multitude of different ways. Sometimes John will use this phrase to refer to people of Jerusalem. 
as we would typically use this phrase, the Jews, biblical times, the people of Jerusalem. This is the Jews versus the Gentiles. And don't think of that as like opposed, but it's either Jew or not Jew, which is Gentile. So sometimes when you hear the word the Jews or Jews in John's gospel, it's not Gentiles. Sometimes, though, Jesus is going to use it, you Jews. And in that, he's going to use it to rebuke the people of Jerusalem for not knowing who he is. And so he's going to use it as people who should know him, but don't. Who should have been ready for his coming, but weren't. And sometimes it'll mean, as it does in our passage, the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. This was the Jewish council, the Jewish elite, whose primary role was to know the truth, was to protect the truth, and was to prepare people to receive the truth. Now, what's interesting about that is what is that truth? Jesus Christ is Lord, and a Savior is coming. And so really, all of these blend together because they're going to be the Jews who fail to know him, and they are from Jerusalem. But this morning, this is the Jewish elite, the Jewish council. And it is they that come to question John the Baptist. Knowing who they are helps us, doesn't it? Again, we can be defined by our profession or by our title. They are the Jews, the Sanhedrin, the the elite the keepers of the truth, if you will. So why are they coming to this man? What are they doing coming to this bizarre man? Dresses the way he does and teaches the way he does? Well, they want to know why. Why are you doing what you're doing? Who gave you the authority? And in, in that is, we are the authority and we didn't give it to you. So why do you come and do what you do? And what exactly was he doing? Well, Matthew's gospel tells us John the Baptist had a very simple message. He was preaching. His message was this, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Turn away from your sin and turn to God and get ready for the Savior is coming. A very simple message, but a profound message. John was a prophet. He dressed like a prophet. He looked like a prophet from old. He came out of the desert. He wore camel hair. He ate locusts and honey. And people would have looked at him and said, you feel out of place. Like you came from long ago. That was intentional. He was meant to look different. It had been over 400 years since the Jewish people had heard anything from the Lord. Uh, Malachi's last words, the day of the Lord is coming. And then all of a sudden, 400 years later, a man out of place, out of time, comes to preach repentance. He looked like a prophet. He dressed like a prophet. He spoke like a prophet. And he went around baptizing people. Now, we want to be careful here with this word baptize, uh, because what John was doing was a bit unique. And I'll let R.C. Sproul explain it. This baptism would be known as the proselyte baptism. It had arisen amongst Jews during the intertestamental period, but it had been limited only to Gentiles. It was administered to non-Jews who were converted to Judaism. Gentiles were considered unclean and therefore needed to go through ritual washing in order to be welcomed and received into the covenant community. So typically this baptism was a washing, was a cleansing of a non-Jew to welcome them into the Jewish community. That's okay. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. Where's the problem? Who was John administering this to? To Jews. Not to Gentiles. And so John the baptizer was telling Jews, you are unclean. You are unworthy. You are not ready. That would have caused problems. That would have caused a stir. That would have shaken things up, right? Because these are the people of God. These are the ones who look to the Gentiles and say, you are unclean. You are unworthy. But John is saying, no, no, no. You're not ready for your own Savior. 
And so John the baptizer, that that title there wouldn't have been given to him as a title of honor. It wouldn't have been one given to him as, oh, he's the one baptizing. It, It probably would have been a little more derogatory. Oh, he's the one going around baptizing Jews as if we need cleansing. And it would have looked as a title of scorn. And so this is why the Jewish elite come, <laughs> and they have questions. And, and, and in this account, in, in John's account, they get right to the point. I, I love, and I'm sure other words were said, but they don't waste time. They ask him, who are you? They know the facts. They know what's going on. They, they've, they've had testimony of, of it happening. Who are you? And really what they're asking is this. Where do you get the authority to say what you say and do what you do? Again, in the mindset, we didn't give it to you. Where do you get this from? And even simpler, the Jews have another question in mind. They have something they really want to know from this bizarre figure. Are you the Messiah? You see, there were accusations and assumptions. There were some that would have speculated that this man may be the promised Messiah, the one who was to come. Now, while that's not what they asked, it's what John answered. It says here, I am not the Christ. Now, what an odd way to answer that question. Who are you? I am not Jesus. That seems a little clunky, right? Uh, it, it's, it's not good manners. It's not good practice when someone asks you a question to start by answering the things that you're not. Because there's a lot more things that you're not than the, what you are. Who are you? I'm not Billy Graham. <laughs> what does that tell you about me? Nothing other than I'm not Billy Graham, which is evident in many ways. But I also want you to see something here that's missed in the English It's not just that John says, I am not the Christ. But listen to verse 20 here, and this is kind of clunky in the English. He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. That may feel a bit odd in our English, um, but again, I've, I've read several commentaries this week. In the Greek... This statement is is stated as strong as can be in the Greek language. There's no way more boldly, more definitively, more clearly to make a statement like this. It's not just that, that John was trying to throw him off the trail. It's not that he's using poetic language. It's not that he's trying to um, be dishonest with them. He knows this is what they want to know. Are you the Christ, whether they asked it or not? And so as clearly, as plainly, and as articulately as he could say it, I am not the Christ. That left them scratching their heads a little bit. Well, that answers that question, all right? But we still don't know who you are, John. So, hmm, let's go back to the drawing board. Well, if he's not the Christ, maybe he's Elijah. You may find yourself this morning going, where do you get that tie? That's a, that's a strange, well, if you're not Christ, maybe you're Elijah. But see, these were the Jewish elite. These were the Pharisees. These were the leaders who knew the Old Testament or were supposed to know the Old Testament. And they would have known a prophecy that comes in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so in their minds, if he's not the Messiah, if he's not the Christ, maybe he's the forerunner. Maybe he's the one to make way. Now, John answers this again honestly. No, I'm not. But this gets a little tricky because he is. (laughs) He is not Elijah. And and, and maybe in his opinion and in their opinion, they thought that it was going to be a resurrected Elijah. That it was going to be Elijah from the dead, come back to the people. I can imagine that's the, the question John thinks he's answering. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 11, verse 14, speaking of John, just a second here. 
Matthew 11, verse 14. And in fact, I'll, I'll jump back to 13. For all the prophets and all the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus says that John is the forerunner. He is the one to mark the day of the Lord has come. But John, again, asking, being asked the question, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not. And so now they're really scratching their heads. Okay, he's not the Messiah. He's not Elijah. Again, he still won't tell us who he is. We're playing these riddle games. And so they're like, okay, we got one more shot at this. Well, then are you the prophet? And it's helpful here to note the, the article, the prophet. If they'd asked, are you a prophet? He would have said, yes, and then we might have gotten somewhere. But no, they ask, are you the prophet? prophet. And again, this is speaking to prophecy. In Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, we are told, God tells Moses, I will raise one up like you in the days to come. And that one, the prophet, will speak the words of God to the people of God. And so these Pharisees, these Jewish elite, believe he is the prophet, the one to come, like Moses, to speak the word of God to the people of God. Again, he says, no, that's not me. And then you can feel their frustration. Well, then who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? You can feel their weariness in that question, right? You can feel like they had in mind this was going to be an easy interview, an easy interrogation. They were going to be quick about their way, and he's made this complicated beyond all belief. And so they're like, okay, you've got to tell us something. Who are you? You've, we know who you're not. Tell us who you are. He says this. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. John's identity, his sense of who he is, is one who goes before the Lord to prepare his coming. He is a forerunner. Now, let's be honest. That doesn't tell us much about John, does it? We don't leave with a good idea of who is John the Baptist. But that's kind of the point. Who is John the Baptist? Who would John say John the Baptist is? I am one who points to Christ. When asked about who he is and what he came to do, he says, I come to make way for the Lord. We could learn much from John's interaction here, couldn't we? When it's asked of you, when people want to know, when they, when they meet you for the first time, what do you say? I sometimes dread that question. I'll be perfectly honest. For me, it often comes up when I'm getting a haircut. I don't like getting that question asked when I'm getting a haircut because there I am. I am stuck for the next 15 minutes and whether they like the answer or not, there we are. What do you do? Who are you? And a lot of times I'll answer, well, I'm a preacher. Oh, well, that's interesting. And then either we're either we're going to sit in awkward silence as they don't want to have anything to do with that question. Or we're going to start talking, oh yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a believer too. I come from a religious background, or I'm a Baptist, I'm a Presbyterian, I'm a Methodist, I'm a whatever it may be. But is that a best description? Is that a good way to define who I am? I'm a preacher, that's what I do. I preach, I proclaim the word of God a lot like John but who am I really? Or better yet, who should I say that I am? Who should I believe that I am? I am a child of God. I belong to my Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I have been bought by his blood and I belong to him and who I am is his. Now that would be a far better answer. It would lead to a lot more quiet haircuts too. <laughs> but I really want you to think about that this morning. John doesn't care that you know who John is. John cares that you know who Jesus is. And that's our second point here. We must know who we are. But the only way we can know who we are is to know who Christ is. And John makes that abundantly clear in the second section. Would you look there with me? <laughs> Having thoroughly frustrated the Jewish elite, they now turn to more practical matters. They've kind of got a rough sketch of who he is. And so they now ask, well then, why are you doing all of this? Why are you preaching? Why are you baptizing? Why are you calling Jews to repentance and telling them that they are unclean? Why do you do these things? In their opinion, he has no title. He has no authority. He himself is unworthy to perform these practices. But what the Jewish elite failed to do, failed to understand, which they should have, knowing their prophecies, is that John did have the authority. He did have the title. He did have the information. He got it from a greater source. John spoke not on their authority, not on his own authority, but as we've already seen in this gospel letter, verse 6, there was a man sent from God. John's authority came from his heavenly father. And so he had all the authority he needed to do these things. I preach, I proclaim, I teach, not on my own authority, but on the authority of the one who sent me. That's what he could have answered. He, he could have said that, and in a lot of ways he did. But he decided to, to, to tackle that in a, in, in a different way. Verse 26, John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. Even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. It's a great irony here. Where did this start? What do they really want to know? Are you the Messiah? John says, no. But then he immediately says, but there is one in amongst your midst who I am unworthy to even untie his sandals. Jesus was amongst them by this point, preparing for his ministry. He would be on the scene in the next section. We're going we're gonna to see him interacting with people. They wanted to know when the Messiah was coming. They wanted to understand him, and he was already there. They were looking for one who was already there, and they missed it. They're over here bothering John when they should have gone to Jesus. And I love what, what John says here. There's one amongst your midst who I don't even deserve to untie his sandals. Now, this is a, an idiom in Jewish culture. You know, a, a servant, a disciple would do many things for his master, would perform many tasks. But there was one task that was deemed so low that it was relegated mostly to the slaves. And that was the cleaning and washing and caring of one's feet. That was a task so low, so beneath anyone of, of dignity or status or title that it could only be relegated to the lowest of the low, the indentured servants. And so what John is saying here, I don't even deserve to be a slave of the man of whom I speak, the one you're looking for, the one who's amongst your midst right now, and you don't see him, you're blind to it. That would have gotten their attention. And that would have told them something about John. They look and they see this man with authority, with, with um, the ability to baptize and to preach. He's gathering crowds. People are listening. Lives are being changed. And yet at the same time, he's saying, I am lower than a slave. 
that would have caught their eye. And it shows a great irony again, doesn't it? Because the Pharisees would look for salvation in all sorts of places, in their rituals, in their customs, in their understanding of the law. But what they would not do is yield themselves to Christ. And again, we find John doing what he did in the earlier section. Who are you? I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. John doesn't care if you know who he is. John wants you to know whose he is. I am my Savior's, his messenger, his representative. I speak for him. He is coming. John clearly sees his role. He, he says he baptizes with water here. He wants to make sure we differentiate this from the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus will perform and will later see take place. Jesus' disciples will perform, excuse me. And then our text concludes with this interesting remark. These things took place in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. This is a, a mark of geographical reference. This is a mark to give us uh, understanding and give us historical accuracy to this. That being said, I have no idea where it is. Uh, scholars love to debate the Bethany here. This is most likely not the Bethany where um, Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived, calling it across the Jordan. And so we may ask ourselves something here in a, in a message about understanding identity and, and clarity, then why? Why would you put this in here if that's going to potentially lead to confusion? Well, I give it two reasons. One, God decided it needed to be there. So it is. And a lot of times that's all we can say about the word of God. We may not understand. But here, here's the second reason. While we may not understand, the people that read this in the early church would have. They would have known where Bethany across the Jordan resided. They could go there. They could see the place. This would have given them an understanding, a, a, a sense of this does make sense to me. And so we hear this, that all of this took place at a real place. This is really happening. This is history. It is not a made-up story. It is not for our imagination. It's not to teach us a good lesson, be true to yourself, or anything silly like that. This is a man who so loves his Savior that to know him is to know Christ. And so we leave this passage this morning, maybe not understanding John the Baptist at all. <laughs> if you came wanting to know who John the Baptist is, I'm sorry. I can tell you a lot of who he's not. But don't we know a little bit more about his Savior, about Christ? John's not the Christ. John is the forerunner. He is the one who says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Make ready the way for the Lord. He is not the Lord, but the one who is quickly coming is. And Lord willing, next week, we'll see how this passage ties into the next. John says, get ready, he's coming. Verse 29, the next day he saw Jesus coming. That's not a mistake. That, that, is, that is the divine act of the Lord, choosing words carefully so that we know everything he says is true and is good. So as we think about this, and, and in a moment, we will prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. I kind of go back to that question of who are you? Who are you? Whose are you? Do you belong to Christ? Do you rest and hope and trust in him? So much so when people ask about you, you can't help but get to a place where you're talking about Jesus. Oh, that that would be true of all of us. Would it be true of my own life? For it's true of John the Baptist. That we hope and cling and rest in him. Let us pray. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I want to be known by you. I want to be known by your word and your truth and your message. I pray that for everyone here this day, 
that who we are is Christians because we are in Christ. Father, I thank you for the example of John the Baptist, his bold proclamation of the message. It cost him his life to do it. But for him, that was well worth taking. For he loved you more than he loved his own life. May it be said the same of us. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for your word. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, we will sing hymn 461. Not what my hands have done. Would you please reach for your hymnal and stand as we sing together. <laughs>